And good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Humanities Center and the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled Southern Journey, the Migrations of the American South, 1790 to 2020. And I'm pleased to be joined by Edward L. Ayers, Tucker Boatwright Professor of the Humanities at the University of Richmond, President Emeritus, and with gratitude, I note that he's also a former and a past trustee of the National Humanities Center. Today is December the 9th. My name is Andy Mink. Uh, welcome, everyone. As always, I want to extend our appreciation on behalf of my team, my staff, Jira and Mike and Meredith, for you choosing to spend um, 90 minutes with us on what I know is a is a uh, strange time of your school year. It's that weird liminal space between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, I hope that um, you are doing well as you uh, approach the holidays uh, in what's been a very disrupted 18 months or so. In particular, as I look out on the room, I want to thank Sarah for being here. Sarah is joining us from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts right there in Richmond, near uh, University of Richmond. Paul is also near um, near uh, Richmond in Powhatan High School. Uh, Paula, thank you for joining us. Pamela is here down in Georgia from St. John Catholic School. Vanessa, thank you for joining us from the Justice Street Academy Charter in LAUSD. And you're joined by many of your colleagues and friends in Los Angeles, including Liesl, Hugo, and Marcia. Can't, can't miss you. You're here from Northwestern State University. And finally, uh, have to thank our friends, Myla and Karen, from joining us from Alaska tonight. Karen is in the Bering Strait School District and Myla is in Seward, Alaska. Thank you everyone for being with us. National Humanities Center, uh, as you know, was founded in 1978 and uh, for the last 40, now 44 years, have welcomed an annual fellowship class of university professors and humanists who have a project idea and come to the center for a full year of unencumbered work and conversation and research and writing. I think one of the big changes and trends that we've seen in the last 10, 15 years, maybe maybe a little longer, is the increased uh, use of technology uh, to support these projects, to visualize the arguments uh, with evidence, to make accessible the process of the work that they're doing across the fields and all disciplines I think, uh, I suspect tonight you'll find and see very specific examples of the way this new modern uh, technology world that we're living in can also be uh, used and leveraged for not just scholarship, but also for teaching. We're going to talk about all of those many things. One of those uh, platforms is the Humanities and Class Digital Library. I appreciate all of you having a library card, and I hope that you find use of this open education resource platform. This is intended to give you free and open access to all the materials at the National Humanities Center, as well as nearly 95 other content provider partners. That does include uh, New American History, which Professor Ayers uh, will, will speak about and tell you about more tonight. One of the things you can find in the library is the subfolder that's associated with tonight. That subfolder is where we place the readings and the links and all the materials and resources we think will be helpful for uh, you to better understand not just what we discussed tonight, maybe looking at them in advance, but also reflecting on them uh, afterwards. Um, when you uh, go to the uh, subfolder, you'll find not just the materials that Professor Ayers has pulled together for you, but also materials that uh, maybe support the instruction as you take these, these learnings and these visualizations uh, forward. As I look through uh, the webinar series, you know, we're, we're at, uh, I think, episode 19 of a 40-episode season. We're just about halfway, just about at the halfway mark. And um, as I look into our spring session, I think that you probably will be attracted by some sessions that also address the very unique uh, collision of time and place as we try to understand these complicated issues. Uh, I encourage you to look through the spring session. Uh, I bet that many of you went in right at the beginning of the year. You signed up for a bunch of sessions you thought you might be interested in. Maybe some dates weren't quite clear. Your calendar was still being juggled. Um, if that's the case, I'd encourage you to go back and share this with your colleagues. That includes sessions like the one on January 5th with Jacoby uh, Williams, uh, past fellow at the center. He'll be discussing his work uh, on the influence of Malcolm X to many other movements uh, around the globe. Or join us on Jan January 25th uh, when past fellow Sandy Darity, who's a professor of public policy at Duke University, will discuss his work in reparations. Or later in the year, you can join us for Valerie Hansen's session. Uh, Valerie's a professor of history at Yale. She'll be discussing the year 1000. And then finally, farther down in the spring, um, in the spring 
series, Tate Keller, another past fellow, will be discussing his work on the environmental impact of World War One. I. I want to thank our Teacher Advisory Council for their ongoing and continued uh, contributions and, and input to the work that we do. We just met actually last night as a group and it was really helpful and meaningful to hear uh, firsthand uh, the state of the nation and all of their classrooms and their districts and their schools from around the country. One of the things that they certainly outlined for me um, was the the um, uh, either post or during traumatic kind of kind of world that we're living in right now. Uh, your students are struggling um, with a lot and we appreciate all the hard work you do in, in bringing uh, not just the curriculum you teach and the content that you address, but also uh, are there for them as they make this transition back into your classrooms. That input that we got from the Teachers Advisory Council though is also input, input that we wanna get from you. I think many of you have uh, opened and checked out the survey that I've recently sent. Uh, this is our community survey we do every couple of years to get a better sense of your needs and the gaps that we can address in the work that we do. Uh, this survey probably shouldn't take you much more than 10 minutes or so, but we would really like your mindful and complete thoughts. And each webinar, we have a drawing where we select one of our responses, and they're able to choose um, from either the collection of books that are associated with this fall's webinars, a free online course from our online course catalog, an NHC swag bag, or if you can get to Durham, Mike, Jira, Meredith, and I will take you out to lunch. So um, we've had a couple of drawings so far. We're going to have another one tonight. Uh, just a minute, let me reach my hand into the big Captain Kangaroo ping pong ball uh, basket, uh, swirl it around, swish it around. And as it turns out, tonight's winner is Brian Engel. Brian, thank you so much. Brian's a teacher in the middle school of St. Francis School in Austin, Texas. And as a matter of fact, I spoke with Brian earlier today about uh, him winning this drawing. And the choice that he made was Professor Ayers' most recent book. So we'll be mailing that to Brian and he'll get it before Christmas and he can uh, read it at his leisure. As you know, tonight is uh, an audio only webinar. And so uh, you'll see the slides, you'll hear our voices, but your contributions are still critically important. Please do use the audience chat box to register thoughts and ask questions and share links and ideas. But use the Ask Professor Ayers tab to submit more formal questions. And as the moderator, I'll cue those up and we'll take a pause uh, where it seems appropriate and I'll bring those to the professor's attention. And uh, if there's anything that needs to be clarified or things you'd like to know more about, please do use that tab. If for any reason tonight you have uh, audio difficulties, if uh, the volume is kind of weird, if the Wi-Fi seems kind of sketchy, don't worry about logging out and coming back in. That will not disrupt your attendance and it will not disrupt our session. But I do wanna make sure that you can hear and be a part of what we're doing tonight. So again, I wanna thank uh, all of you for being here for tonight's Humanities in Class webinar. It's titled Southern Journey, Migrations of the American South, 1790 to 2020. I'm joined by Edward L. Ayers from the University of Richmond. And I'm also pleased to welcome Jared Morris, who is a member of our this year's TAC uh, Teachers Advisory Council, and he'll be serving as tonight's TA. He'll be dropping links and thoughts and questions in the chat box. He's also uh, curated some resources that we've put in the digital library for your review. That's my introduction, Ed. Great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us all the way from Central Virginia. Professor Ayers, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you too. I sure can. Thank you. I'm glad that, uh, that you're able to join us tonight. Um, we've got a, a wide and, and diverse audience who's anxious to hear the story that you're going to share with us and to show us. But I wonder if I can start tonight uh, before I hand the reins over to you with just a quick question. I'll put you on the spot a little bit. All right. Um, I, I, I suspect that you, uh, in your own training as a graduate student, as an early career historian, um, was do, probably engaged in the, in the process of doing history, in the process of your scholarship, in pretty conventional ways. Um, then technology really sort of exploded. Um, do you remember when you first realized how much power technology would give you as a teacher, as an educator, as a scholar? To, uh, to make sense of, to visualize these complicated arguments that you were trying to make? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Well, I would say that uh, I was never that conventional because uh, it occurred to me in the 1970s that technology could be uh, remarkable. Uh, I was uh, in graduate school uh, during the brief era. We sometimes call it Thursday, 
when quantitative methods seem like a good idea for historians. And uh, the idea was um, that we could democratize the American past by mm -hmm. quantifying it, that we could include everybody in the story. So I have no native capacity for anything uh, arithmetic or technological, but I could see that if I wanted to, uh, as it turned out, my dissertation was about crime and punishment in the American South, um, that I would need to at least count things. And so my mother was a fifth grade teacher, so it only took me, what, 45 seconds to pander uh, to the audience tonight. So, uh, and she, she may appear later as well, um, that uh, she mimeographed uh, forms <laughs> that I used to go into courthouses and record all the homicides and assaults and robberies uh, in uh, three counties in Georgia. Then I had to go back to graduate school and pay somebody to punch all those in cards and then mingle in with all of the engineers at the computing center where you would submit the cards to uh, men, as it turned out, who looked quite priest-like in white coats behind glass who would then run your cards through the big mainframe computer and give you output. And uh, I remember very proudly walking back to my table from picking up the printout uh, and looking down and noticing and hoping nobody else did that it, all it said was error 17235 like 10,000 times. <laughs> so that was my introduction to quantitative methods. I taught myself uh, statistics to the extent that I learned them. And so um, that is my experience in the 70s. Um, our paths crossed a little bit later than that when the idea of network computers uh, came out. And uh, so I'll pause there, but to suggest that I've been trying quantitative stuff really from the very beginning of my work, and yeah. tonight is kind of what we might do with it uh, in the 21st century. Yeah, you know, if, if we could see our audience, I think you might see some smoke coming out of the ears because in some ways I think you've said something that, uh, that all of our educators in our audience um, grapple with, which is, which is the sort of default of teaching the past through iconic figures. And it sounds like what you're suggesting is the democratic um, representation of, of everybody is really the way to go. Well, it's really, you know, I've been doing this 40 years now, and uh, it's the only commonality I can really see across my work. I've been trying to find whatever strategy might work uh, to include as many voices as possible. And so Southern Journey that we'll be talking about tonight uh, actually includes the entire population, black and white and native and immigrant uh, of the American South, and includes the half the population or slightly more than half, I'm sure that was female. And so it's going to be ironic that I think technology might be a way for us to write the most democratic history of all, because many people left no record in the historical documents except a single line on a, a census record somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. That line denoted uh, their sex and their race. Uh, it's a terrible fact about American history, but useful for the project tonight that from the very first census, uh, the United States government thought it important to differentiate white people from black people. And so that's a, a commonality. And we'll talk a little bit later about new American history, the ways that uh, we simply cannot afford to waste the opportunities that these new technologies present. So um, even longer than I've been an actual historian with an actual book then, uh, almost half a century, I've been trying to see if we might wring some insight out of these computers, Andy. Fantastic. Thank, thank you for sharing that uh, as an introduction. Again, as the moderator, I'll be bringing questions to you on occasion. Um, we also have some, uh, some short animations and videos that we'll be playing and you, you know, they're queued up in the slides, but uh, we'll take a pause and I'll bring those forward as a pop-up. Uh, but for now, you can, uh, you can drive the PowerPoint and we look forward to the story you're about to share. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of you teachers for joining us this evening. We're honored and delighted. And I'm saying us, I'm talking about Annie Evans, who is my colleague in the American history that you'll be hearing from later and who is present in the chat um, and who is, uh, my ally in uh, this project of new American history, which we're trying to make American history 
democratic in every way, using every medium that we can think of. Uh, there's podcasts, the videos, interactive maps, uh, and journalism, uh, primary documents, all these kinds of ways that to have young people not be the way that I was uh, in middle school and high school, which was clueless about why in the world I should care about these dead people. Uh, it seemed uh, irrelevant to me, and we simply can't afford to have that. So we'll be talking about some of those um, uh, projects a little bit later. But tonight is um, something that's both a book, and I must say it's a beautiful book. I'm flattered that your prize winner took one. I, I think as, a, as an artifact, it's really beautiful. It's, it has over 80 full-color original maps that we're, we're going to explore tonight. Uh, and it also has some words in it that I wrote. Uh, as I talk about these maps, I tend to forget that I had to actually figure out what they meant and, and translate to the words because the maps are so beautiful. The maps are uh, a result of the collaboration with uh, Justin Madrid and Nathaniel Ayers from the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. Um, and I'm, I'll show you what the maps look like, and then we'll talk about where they came from. Um, I, I'm so honored to be a part of uh, the great work that uh, the NHC does and uh, try to live up to that opportunity. So, Southern Journey, we're getting ready to cover 230 years in the time that we have. Uh, we're going to break it up into uh, three different parts, and we'll have Q&A after each one. Um, part one is going to be the Slave South. Part two will be the South between the end of the Civil War and World War II. And part three will be the history of the South up to the present. Um, and in each part, we will use a common vocabulary visually. Uh, one thing I will show you here, I'm very proud of this. I didn't make these maps, but I'm a partner with my friends who did. And we won the prize this last year for best cartography from the people who make story maps and also special award from the International uh, Consortium for uh, Geography. So uh, it's a, a case where historians are actually making up our own methods uh, and our own techniques. Um, and we're not just reliant on what we are handed, uh, but can invent our own methods. So let me show you what it is that I'm talking about. So this is going to be creating the American South, 1790 to 1860. And one of the things we need to remember is that the South is the size of continental Europe. Um, and it is a, an area that uh, at the beginning of this period was occupied by native people who had been there for centuries. They'd been mobile for centuries. They themselves had migrated. These red lines are uh, signs of the kinds of connections among all of them uh, that you would find really tracing across the continent. One thing about this book is I'm trying to put white people, black people, and indigenous people in the same frame so that we can see how they made each other's history. And those of you who are not from the South or in the South, um, we'll be showing the later maps. The maps that we are sharing uh, represent the whole United States. Uh, so you'll be able to see your part of, of the United States in those maps. But in the meantime, we need to recognize that this is the crucible in which slavery grew, uh, in which the Civil War was nurtured, in which segregation was fostered for over 100 years, and in which the the great moral revolution of the civil rights movement was hatched from within the South itself, from black people who had been disadvantaged uh, throughout their entire uh, lives. So here's one of these maps that um, we'll be talking about. And here's the method. It's actually pretty simple once you figure it out. Areas that are varying shades of blue are places where the population of that ethnicity is declining. So that you'll see here, this is the white population in the first decade that we have census records for. Um, and you'll see that already uh, white people are abandoning the area where slavery first began in what became the United States in eastern Virginia uh, and also uh, even in South Carolina. Right now, they are moving to the Piedmont. Uh, where I live, uh, where I first met Andy, uh, and where Thomas Jefferson's plantation is at this time. And so the white population uh, is moving to the west, but you'll also see that it is moving down the Shenandoah Valley in East Tennessee, back up into the bluegrass of Kentucky. This is the, the first migration of the American South 
Um, you'll recognize Daniel Boone. You'll hear, have heard of Cumberland Gap, you know, the Shenandoah Valley and all that. But it's amazing really how, how fast uh, the bluegrass of Kentucky grows. The other thing that you'll recognize is that this is the upcountry of South Carolina that's growing. Uh, and you will remember uh, that this is the decade after the cotton gin is uh, introduced and invented in South Carolina. So uh, I resist the idea that the cotton gin is the machine that moves all of Southern history, that moves all slavery, because we have seen that uh, slaveholders adapt uh, enslavement to any opportunity that presents itself. That's one of the things that we'll see tonight. So in bluegrass of Kentucky, cotton will not grow. They are growing hemp. And in some ways to, to make bagging to contain cotton, but it's also, of course, the basis for linen. So what you're seeing here is that moving down into East Tennessee, and if you're wondering what kind of accent this is that you're hearing, hearing, <laughs> it's from East Tennessee. So I'm from the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina. So you get the idea that the areas that are varying shades of gold is where the population is increasing most rapidly. Now, one of the things you'll notice here, those of you who have maybe done genealogy or uh, studied uh, American history on the county level, will know the county boundaries are constantly changing. So one of the things that Justin and Nathaniel invented uh, was this method for us to be able to see movement far, uh, far more granular uh, way than through counties. So count, different parts of counties will be able to see at different rates of growth. So you'll see uh, a far more fluid picture uh, maps of, than we have in our textbooks, which drive me crazy, especially when you have the entire states that are supposedly red or blue the way they are in so many of our textbooks. Uh, we know from our own experience today that you can drive 10 miles one direction or another and be in a red area or a blue area. Well, the past was just as complex and subtle. So this method is a way of seeing uh, the actual fluidity of uh, the population. So that's white population. You have that in mind. That's black population. Now look at the difference. What this means, is, so this is the forced migration of enslaved people. It means that they are not free to move where they wish. So they are being moved directly to the Piedmont, the area that's really now coming into its own. Monticello is right there. You can see how Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe, James Madison are all a part of this area. Uh, and you can also see how in South Carolina, it's moving very rapidly and in just in an area in, in the upper south. But you can see that enslaved people are taken only to a few places. They're taken to the bluegrass, but they are not deployed anywhere in the Shenandoah Valley or in East Tennessee. So this is a pattern that we're going to see repeatedly. You'll see already another pattern that's going to repeat is that Eastern Virginia is going to be steadily depopulated by men and women and children being ripped away from their families and sold in the brutal slave markets. Maryland, Delaware, especially Eastern Virginia, and this is something that people often don't realize. Virginia will remain the state with the largest number of enslaved people all the way up to the Civil War. And yet, 400,000 enslaved people are going to be sold out of Virginia. So, you know, today Virginia's identity regionally is unclear. Uh, depends on who's selling somebody something. But uh, certainly in the 19th century, uh, Virginia was the seedbed for the population of enslaved people across the American South, but it's also the place that so many white people left as well. It's a pattern that we'll see. So we're going to trace this over time. We'll be able to watch various parts of uh, Southern history unfold. Here you're seeing, and, and you'll, you can see the dates. This is very early. The sugar plantations along the lower Mississippi are being brought in. And this is the basin in, in which Nashville uh, is located. You can see that the black population of, the, of bluegrass is already being depopulated. That's because if enslaved people are worth more somewhere else, chances are they're going to be sold and sent somewhere else. So the fundamental experience of African-American people in slavery is the constant threat and reality of forced migration. 
in my experience teaching uh, students, I ask them what does slavery look like? And somewhere in some textbook, there's been a picture of a cotton field with enslaved people standing there. That's not really a fair representation of what the experience of slavery was like for most black families. The experience of slavery was any day waking up and the possibilities of your children or your parents or your siblings being sold. So that's an important reason that I chose to make this book about the migrations of the American South, because I think that of stereotypes of the South, and I see this repeated all the time in all kinds of media, including our textbooks, the South is seen as a static place, a place notable mainly for not moving like the rest of the United States does. And in fact, we have words such as the Old South or even the Antebellum South that make it sound as if it is just standing still. In fact, I argue that the only defining trait that cuts across all these uh, centuries of Southern history is constant movement. So you'll notice areas that are, are Black are areas where the census is not counting people. As we'll see soon, those areas are far from empty, but it is not where the census represents people. You see the same pattern here. White population is concentrating there in the rich lands of the bluegrass and Nashville, enslaved people being taken from lots of different places and moved to that. Often, if you've been sold, the chances of being sold again were not diminished. You might be moved just another county away. But if you are moved another county away, you're just as far from your son or daughter as you would have been. Uh, it's just it's re the chances of seeing them again were remarkably low. You can see that white people are moving up into what's now West Virginia. Uh, a constant pattern is that white people are leaving the South. Now you see where they are. Now let's see what happens. So this is um, any one of the, the first animations. This is one of the things that you can see on the story map that we've made available, which is a, um, a story map in which all these maps are available to you and your students freely. Um, so Andy, can you play this video and we'll show people how it works? I sure can. And uh, let me be clear with our audience that when I open this video clip, it's very short and it will uh, appear as a pop-up on your screen. There is no audio, so don't worry about hearing anything. You're, you're not, there's no connection problem uh, when I play this. So Matter of fact, the they can hear me, right, Andy? They, they I, can I hear you, but they can Yes, I just didn't want them to think that there should be audio <laughs> with, a, with a video clip, yeah. Um, so we're gonna play the comparison of black and white population change, 1810 to people move only when white people move them, but what you find is that white people, most white people in the South do not own enslaved people. Uh, and so as a result, white people are often moving opposite direction of where black people are being taken. So slide back over to slides, there we go. And so this gives you a sense now of how the South is being created, okay? So this is black population and you'll see this is the first steps of what we think of as the black belt. This is the, this is the first steps of what is gonna grow into the Mississippi Delta. This is the first uh, areas of West Tennessee that becomes a great plantation area, okay? You see, white people are now, what's going on here? This is a confusing. What are they doing here? And why are they, these black areas in the middle of the South? If Andy would play the next video, we would be able to see how that works. So the next video is titled, uh, 
Sessions of indigenous sessions lands. Sessions of indigenous 18... lands between 1814 and 1835. Right. Okay. Here we go. I don't believe this is actually the. Is this the wrong one? Sorry, Ed. Yeah, uh, it, this is okay. It shows people what the story map looks like. And so that's fine that people can see how all these different maps are explained. I'm, I'm sure not as eloquently as, as I am, but and there's the comparison you just saw. We're coming up soon, Andy, and what we want to show is just keep on rolling. That's good. Yep. Okay, right here. This is amazing to me even though I helped make it. Look at sessions of, of the lands of native people between 1814 and 1835. Now we teach in uh, our schools about the Trail of Tears, which is where it says 1835 here is the very last part of the movement of the Cherokee. You can stop that now, Andy. Uh, and that what you, we show in that map is that the great majority of what we think of as the American South is occupied by indigenous people through all of this period. The other thing you'll notice is that the native people already knew where the richest land was. And so one of the terrible paradoxes uh, of Southern history is that the expansion of slavery, and this is going to be the pattern you're going to recognize throughout the rest of Southern history. This is the richest land in the South. It's actually the, the an ancient coast where the water used to come up to here left this remarkably black soil. This is the other richest soil, which is the Mississippi Delta and Western Tennessee. Here you can see this is when the, the slave trade really takes off. Look at what's happening in Virginia and coastal Carolina and even the parts of South Carolina that had been settled just 15 years earlier. And enslaved people drag there from Virginia down to South Carolina or from the coast. It's already being depopulated because these lands are far more fertile than even in South Carolina. So this is the Black Belt, and it's taken directly from the lands that indigenous people had occupied. This shows you the something that people, historians, have debated forever. Was slavery profitable or not? I'd say that all historians agree now it was remarkably profitable for white people and that it created uh, a, a society of, that most of the counties of, of the richest counties in America were usually counties that had, had slavery. And, but you'll see it's also very volatile, the price of enslaved people. So what we just saw through the 1830s, it's prices of enslaved people going up. Then there's a huge panic, 1837, in the last almost a decade, uh, in which slave prices are decreased. But in the 1850s, look what slave prices do. They skyrocket. So this is important to understand the coming of the Civil War. This is the, the so-called Trail of Tears that we know. And what you see is that exactly where indigenous people are driven away is where the white population uh, goes and where the black population goes. So here you're seeing that uh, in, in this decade, still areas that have not been occupied uh, by white people because native people have been taken there. There's the black population. You see the, uh, the black belt growing. Now, at the same time that that's happening, of course, there is other kinds of population movement going. Uh, this is the percentage of foreign-born population in 1860. And as you know, uh, there's this, the, 15 years before this, had seen the uh, great migration of Irish people after the, the potato famine. Uh, and you can see the extent to which uh, they chose to go to areas where they would not be uh, living in a slave society. They do live in the cities. Uh, there's a lot of Irish people in New Orleans and Savannah uh, and in, in German people in Texas. But what you're seeing is this great disparity. But notice this is quite late in this period. Up to this time, the South is growing as rapidly as the North. It's spreading geographically as fast because 
of the portability of enslaved labor. So if we think about this in a global environment, the American South is unique. So there are other places settled by people from uh, Britain, like Australia, South Africa, Canada, New Zealand, that do the same thing of removing the indigenous people, driving them away, and settling with white population. The American South is unique in the sense that it removes the indigenous people and then settles it with people from a third continent, enslaved people from Africa. And that most of the wealth and the actual creation of the South is the result of this settlement. So to understand the American South, you have to understand Native history and African American history and white history. Now, when we created these maps, uh, these were not maps that we're used to seeing in history where we already know what happened and we draw a map to show it. These are maps that are more like MRIs when you, when you uh, go to the hospital and they look to see what's happening inside. So this is one of the things that we discovered. Here, areas that are varying shades of green, blue, are areas where female enslaved people predominate. Areas that are varying shades of brown, orange, are where male enslaved people predominate. Now, we're not surprised to see the sugar districts of Louisiana uh, dominated by men because the slave market produced a highly selective process by which over 90% of the people bought to work in the, in the cane fields were male. Why, why is all the rest not dominated by men? Well, because most of the white families who owned enslaved people had only one or two that they could claim. And if they were going to buy one enslaved person, it was a lot more uh, economically advantageous to buy a woman whose children would become the property of the slave owners. And the women could do much of the work that men could do anyway. What you find here in Virginia, I think, is that because of the, the activity of the slave market, um, that these women had been taken away from their families and leaving it, uh, a male predominant uh, population in the upper south as a result. So that's an overview of the remarkably dynamic system of slavery, exactly the opposite of the way that most of us think of it as a system that was static. People sometimes talk about the old South, but what you have is that Mississippi is about as old as most of today's subdivisions at the time of the Civil War. It's brand new, and not to mention Texas. How new or Arkansas how new, or northern Florida, all those places have only been settled by white and black people for less than 20 years. So our fundamental vision of American history is mistaken if we see a complete or static slave South. So Andy, I will pause there and see if there are questions that you would like to convey to me. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to talk about whatever people would like to talk about. Fantastic. And I'll, I'll remind our audience that they can submit formal questions about tonight's conversation into the Ask the Professor tab, and I'll bring this forward. One, one thing I'd like you to talk a little bit about, though, um, and you did talk about this some at the very beginning, but these are such beautiful and elegant maps, particularly when, they're, when, they're, when you can see the animation. Describe to us once again the data that is behind these colors and the dots and the, and the shapes. What, what is the data that you're mining from? So the thing about this, Andy, is that this is just census data that's already available to everybody. Right. Um, and that was one of the things, you know, obviously you and I worked together on the Valley of the Shadow Project in which the uh, task was to type lots of words from manuscript records uh, it, so they become machine readable. We've inherited mountains of machine readable data. My idea, and Southern Journey and in the Digital Scholarship Lab that we'll look at a little bit later, is that what we should be doing is taking advantage of the fact that we're all carrying around supercomputers in our pockets to visualize these complex patterns that you cannot see in any way other than as a visualization. And I think the most effective visualization is a map. 
because people can literally see on a landscape they, whose shapes they recognize um, uh, people moving. So the data is just the population census of the United States from each census from 1790 up to uh, 2020. Thank you. Uh, this question comes from, um, from Molly. Molly is joining us from Toledo tonight. And Molly's wondering, and I'm, I'm going to bring this question early in, the, in the, the three sections of our talk tonight on purpose. Um, she's wondering if, as an historian, you're using census records here, what data is not available, it wasn't created, it was lost, et cetera, that you wish you had to fully form the map that we're looking at? Well, you may have noticed that when I showed you native people's history, I showed you maps of space rather than maps of actual individual people. Um, and that's because the United States Census did not record native peoples. So I can't make the same kind of maps. I'd love to have the granularity of what it meant to, for the decades in which the United States government and the uh, state governments of the South uh, try to dislodge uh, the Cherokee and Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole people from their land, uh, because that was a far more protracted and uneven and resisted process than the language of the Trail of Tears represents. Uh, that simply uh, made people would not leave, especially uh, you may know that they, the Cherokee uh, maintained a foothold in where I'm from, Western North Carolina and East Tennessee uh, through all this. I wish that I could see them. Uh, that's a yeah. great question um, because, but otherwise we are seeing uh, everybody who was there, at least as their presence of, are they, and even if they're not moving and the counties are black, they're still there. It's just showing that they're, they're not moving at that time. Great, thank you. This question comes from Heather. Heather's in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And she's wondering, uh, you know, you've worked a lot with census records. I suspect that many of our audience have, they're freely available. Um, but remind us for the audience who hasn't seen a census record from this time, what information is generally collected on a census record from this period? Yeah, it varies dramatically. Uh, on the very first ones, uh, it really was um, race, so-called, uh, and sex. Uh, and it was pretty much the, just counting, um, which works for these purposes, but it's grossly inadequate. In the 1840s and 1850s, the census becomes much more detailed. Uh, and 1840s, a scandalous um, uh, census because it claims to show that free black people in the North were far more likely to be insane, feeble-minded, I guess they called it, uh, illiterate or diseased than the enslaved people of the South. And so the Southern politicians seized on this obviously flawed uh, information as proof of the beneficence of slavery. I think I, I read today, there's one county in Massachusetts, I think, where the census identified 113 of the 115 free black people there is mentally deficient in some way, you know. So uh, then over time, they, in 1850, 1860, they began recording the amount of property they have, and they began uh, doing agricultural census, manufacturing censuses, and a slave owner census. Uh, You've heard me mention the, the Valley of the Shadow Project, project that Andy and I worked on back in the 1990s. You can look there uh, at a county in the Shenandoah Valley. You can see the, these censuses uh, down to each individual, exactly what they covered and the way that we've quantified it so that you could see, did people who owned enslaved people own a lot of real estate as well? Or were there... I, I tell the story about my daughter when she was 11 when I was making this. Uh, she's now a filmmaker, so some time has passed. She walked in and said, Daddy, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working on this project where we can see the people of the past. She says, are there any other girls named Hannah there? And we look, and sure enough, there were 11, and uh, five of them were black and six of them were white. So she said, well, 
said, Dad, tell me about them. And so it was a way to um, open the door of history using a first name. So the census has all of that information. So if you go to the Valley of the Shadow Project at the University of Virginia, you'll be able to see what the census looks like in great detail. Mm, thank you. Uh, Craig, who is in Provo, Utah, uh, asked us uh, a sort of a follow-up question, I think, um, in terms of, again, this 19th century data that we're talking about. What government entity collected it, and how was it stored before it was eventually digitized? Uh, was this a state, a local, a federal agency, and, and where did these files live? That's a great question. Uh, the, the files were in the United States Census Bureau. It's one of the first national agencies the United States created, uh, showing how important they considered the census because, as you all know, this is going to determine representation in Congress uh, and the tax rates. Everybody will remember the three-fifths clause and so forth, right? Well, unless you know how many people there are, the three-fifths clause doesn't count, right? So th this is here for not for historians' later use, uh, but for political and economic reasons at the time. And so they would be taken by uh, local census takers who would basically just walk from one farm to another town and, and submit these. Then they would be sent to Washington to the Federal Census Bureau. Uh, tragically, the 1890 manuscript census burned. So there's a huge hole uh, in American history and American genealogy uh, because they were all stored together where it was destroyed. Um, then in the 1940s, they began to be uh, microfilmed. And the, the, the Church of Latter day Saints uh, has done remarkable work in uh, preserving these records, digitizing them, uh, created the, the basis of what became Ancestry.com, um, and has really enabled this remarkable genealogical work. So it's kind of amazing the fact that these data from every single county, which had to be gathered by hand, and then sent to Washington, and then stored on paper for all those centuries, and then converted to microfilm, and then converted to machine-readable form are available. But but they are, and it it's, it's allows us to do things like this that we couldn't do otherwise. It also allows, last time I saw genealogy, is the first or second most popular hobby in the United States. Um, mm. And so I've, I've given talks, and genealogists find this really interesting because they're looking at individuals, but they don't know the big patterns in which their, their families were uh, involved. Great. One more question, uh, Professor, and then we'll move forward into the second section of tonight's talk. Uh, this comes from Tisha. Tisha is at the Hopkins School in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Tisha is noting, by the way, that this really is monumental and exciting work. And she wonders if you thought about continuing your examination of the American South in relation to the global South. There seems to be interesting parallels in population and migration, forced and otherwise. That's a great question. Um, and I would say that when we get into the uh, third part of our talk, uh, strong inducement to stay, uh, we'll see how uh, involved the American South is with the global South, that those lines are blurring all along. You know, right now, uh, if, just looking at this map that's on the screen, uh, we all know that Cuba is only 90 miles off the, the bottom of the screen here and could be included here. Many people would have predicted that Cuba was the next state uh, to join the United States and with slavery. Um, and so it was always a part of the imagining of where slavery would go. Uh, people know, too, that part of the reason the annexation of Texas uh, and then the war with Mexico uh, the belief that slavery was destined uh, to keep moving to the South, uh, where it made more financial sense. That was actually an argument to annex Texas, is that it would become a kind of funnel through which the enslaved population would be moved out of the South. So that was an argument that pro-slavery people made to anti-slavery people to say, but let us get Texas even though it could be five more slave states, uh, it's actually going to be a way that the global South will absorb uh, the, the, uh, the slavery of the upper South. And you can see, they can look at a map such as this one with Virginia and say slavery is naturally moving in that direction anyway. 
Um, and so that's one of the uh, things to understand is that people at the time knew that slavery was mobile and tried to imagine different futures for it. And of course, that's one reason we have the Civil War <laughs> is that both the slaveholders and the people who hated slavery because they were abolitionists or the larger proportion of white northern people who hated slavery because it would preclude their opportunities uh, fought over the future of slavery because they knew how mobile it was. I'm sure your right. students have often said, well, that's crazy. What do, they, what do they want California? You can't have slavery in California. Well, if you look to see where the largest cotton producing states are, California is one of them today. And slavery, and, and this is a horrifying implication of the maps that I'm showing you, slavery was remarkably adaptable. It could adapt to cities, it could adapt to industry, it could adapt to uh, creating railroads, it would have been uh, very helpful for mining. You think about, again, California and the gold mines. So I think American history makes more sense if we understand that people at the time knew just how portable and valuable enslaved labor was. Um, so it, that's a, a way to think about the global south is that they were thinking about it at the time. Great. Well, let's move through to the second session. Uh, unfortunately, I'm also, in addition to being the moderator, the timekeeper, uh, we have about 35 minutes left. Okay, that's good. And, and just so people will know, that's how long I meant for us to spend on that section. So I'm, I'm comfortable yeah. with this. So here's another kind of map that, this is a heat map that perhaps you've seen. And this is a map of where the United States Army came into contact with African-American people. And that what you can see, you'll recognize certain patterns from the maps that we've seen before. Virginia, which is both, as I told you, the largest slave state, but also the state that's most infiltrated by the United States Army, sees the largest number of, uh, of contacts between the United States Army and enslaved people. And some of you may know about Fort Monroe, the contraband decision uh, in which three weeks after Virginia secedes, Black people go to the United States fort and say, we're on your side. Slavery begins to unravel as soon as Virginia secedes and black people have an ally nearby. You can also see, however, that the United States Army moved all along the Atlantic coast and all along the Mississippi Delta. But you can also see that by the end of the war, over 3 million enslaved people had never come into contact with the United States Army. All of us will have heard of June King slavery, right? Uh, and it's not until June of 1865 that enslaved people hear about freedom. But here you can see why, because the United States Army is not there during the course of the war to, uh, to collaborate with enslaved people to make them free. So this is another way that, that this is a, another project at the University of Richmond uh, where we visualize this is the official records of the War of the Rebellion, 126 volumes uh, that take up massive spaces in the library. We digitize them so that we could actually see the geographic patterns hidden within. So here you'll see a, a pattern you're going to recognize. White people basically fleeing the plantation south in the decade of the Civil War. Uh, you can see how they are moving from the Black Belt into the Upper South. But here is something that will puzzle your students, perhaps. Enslaved people are fleeing the areas where the United States Army came and allowed them to free themselves, but they are moving to the same black belt. And it's Western Tennessee, Louisiana, why? Well, try to explain sharecropping to students. What this means is they get half of what they grow. Well, if you can grow a lot more cotton on rich land of the Black Belt or new lands of Texas or Arkansas, you have a lot better chance of being able to accumulate enough money to buy your own farm. However, there's nothing you can really grow in Virginia or really washed out South Carolina or even bluegrass of Kentucky that is uh, worth sharing. So black people are moving to the South in the first decades of emancipation, which I find students will find surprising. Something else they'll find surprising is that 
There is far more cotton grown in 1910 over a far greater area than in 1860. Look at Texas. Look how much more cotton is being grown there. But how much farther north cotton is being grown because of fertilizer and the Mississippi Delta. One more example. The South never sits still. There's never a decade where profound transformations are not happening. So this is black population, 1900 to 1910. So this is before the Great Migration. And you can see that black people are moving to, to the West. They're moving to these other kinds of areas. But we'll, we'll see what happens later. In the meantime, this is showing the spread of the boll weevil. Well, you'll see the effect of this, that it's not until much later, after the boll weevil first enters the South, that places like Georgia and South Carolina are devastated by it. At the same time, you're seeing the cotton textile industry emerging in the South, taking away and displacing, frankly, uh, that of New England. So these are things that are happening simultaneously that have no connection with each other. But here's the white population change. You can still see that people are starting to move to these dots. Those are cities. And that the urban population of the South, the rate of growth is faster than that of the rest of the United States. So the cities and towns of the South are growing at a remarkable rate in the so-called New South period. And here you can see white population. Uh, you can see it more concentrated here. And these are, we're switching over now. Those of you who are friends in California uh, and in the Northeast, you can see that this urban growth across the South, but there are large parts of the United States where white people are leading. So the amount of complexity in all of these, and the beauty of it is that you can talk about your place as we get farther into the 20th century. So even if you're not interested in the South, now look at this. So we all know from our textbooks what the Great Migration supposedly looks like. It's big red arrows moving up the Mississippi River to Chicago. This is what it really looks like. This is the areas of the Black Belt. You see most, there's a great deal of stability at this time. But black people are moving directly to the cities to the north. And there's a whole array of them, but they are not moving to the countryside. So they're taking advantage of the new rail networks to move in, into the cities of the north. So great migration is true the way we think of it in, in the terms of it's a rural to urban, but it tends to be rural to southern town or city to the north. It's very seldom the way that people imagine it, of people going directly from the cotton fields of the Mississippi Delta to Chicago. Instead, black people have moved every decade since emancipation to find new opportunities, for the children to have a chance to go to school, for safety, and for create their own churches. So that what you're seeing is the, the, the growth of an urban population in the South that becomes, um, I'm going to move past this one, that, that becomes uh, the northern population. But look at this. This is the Great Migration is, doesn't stop after World War I. In fact, in the decade of the 1930s, and then it really accelerates. So much of what we're seeing is the Great Migration is a multi-generational effort. You can see it's still going to the same places, but you can see, imagine what this is doing to the South, all these Black people leaving. So Andy, as I promised, that part was shorter. So we just covered the decades from emancipation uh, to World War II. I don't know if people might have questions about that. Yeah, and that, that's a time travel that uh, many of our educators probably feel uh, comfortable with because they go through their, yeah. their text specifically. <laughs> but, but, you know, in some ways, um, at least for a long time, maybe this is starting to, to evolve and change, but for a long time, teaching history was in a chronology, but that chronology was the numbers of pages in the textbook. Everything went in a linear fashion as they were laid out. And I think a lot of younger people probably thought that the rest of the world was standing in repose until you got off that page and went to the next one. Um, Ural, who is in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Richland One School District, has asked if you can talk a little bit from an historian's perspective about the value of, uh, of teaching or discussing simultaneity, where 
where you really have kids understand, young people understand that things are happening all at the same time, not consecutively. Yeah, that's a great, thank you very much for that question. And that's one of the things that's most exciting to me about digital methods, because the English language and probably most languages don't really deal with simultaneity very well. So we have words like meanwhile, right? You know, that doesn't really help you understand things. So with the map that's covering the size of the United States, you can see, just looking at this one map that's on the screen now, uh, I'm not sure where the black population of uh, California, what's happening actually in the 30s, uh, except we, we do know that this is the least mobile decade until our own in American history. We're living in a time of great population stagnation compared to all the rest of American history. Um, mm. And so the, the maps allow us to see simultaneity in a way that's impossible any other way. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll ask my students, freshmen coming to college, name something that happened in African-American life between the end of Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement. And sometimes the answer is, well, Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois argued with each other. Otherwise, the, the Great Migration has become popular, but up until that, black history, and this is an issue of the simultaneity, is basically frozen in place. And mm -hmm. especially black Southerners who remain the, the black population, the majority, remain in the South, we need to remember. And one important thing to remember, you might ask your students, well, where does the civil rights movement come from? Well, it comes from black Southerners who live in towns and cities. Well, how did they get there? They weren't there at, in the era of the cotton plantations of uh, slavery. They moved there to make lives for themselves. Where does Dr. Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks come from? They come from a, a black ambition and determination while the rest of the country is looking somewhere else, building the institutional and moral strength to launch a campaign against this evil system of, of segregation. So I think, you know, if, it's only if we can see simultaneity that we can understand things like Reconstruction and the Old West are the same time. You know, people, yeah. and our textbooks just can't deal with that because of linearity. So I think that maps allow us to see simultaneity, which is one of the most important things to understand about American history, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, our, our good friend, Ron, Ronald, uh, who is at Rutland High School in Vermont, is asking, and is noting, I should say, and this is the advantage of having you here as a, a master storyteller to annotate these maps, but now that we've left it on the screen a little bit, Ron has noticed that uh, and is amazed by how it seems black migration uh, to southern urban areas is as much as to northern cities, which kind of flies in the face of what we often teach. Um, respond to, to, his, uh, to what he's noticed in this map. Yeah, uh, and I'm showing here a little bit earlier. Think about what Houston and Dallas, and then as we're gonna see here, wait till this blows up in World War II, <laughs> we're gonna really see a pattern, is that this has been my crusade really since the 90s. Southern history in general is frozen in, in place, either as the place where something good happens, you know, it's Mayberry or it's the place where country music, whatever, or it's a terrible place where there is no hope for any kind of progress or movement. Well, every obstacle that could be placed in, the, in, the, in front of black people was, but that does not mean that stopped them. And so this movement to cities is actually an example. So Birmingham, Atlanta, as well as Houston and Dallas are growing just as fast as cities in the North. So thank you for noticing that. I think that's the sort of thing, this just dislodges so many of the easy assumptions that our students have because they've not ever had a chance to see anything else. So the, the whole idea of these maps, I appreciate people saying good storyteller, but the fact is, is that each map tells a story in and of itself that your middle school students will be able to understand. That's what I love about this, is that it is a puzzle that people can figure out and in the process of figuring out, figure out important things about American history. Fantastic. Shall we go one on last to part question. three? 
Okay. Yeah, well, okay. one last question, if you don't mind. I'm going to go back to this slide. Oh. Uh, this question comes from Jen. Jen is nearby in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Jen is wondering if you can explain what's happening in the bright blue spot in North Carolina, 1930 to 1940 black population change map. What's happening in North Carolina right there? Well, North Carolina is like Virginia uh, for black people. Uh, it's a good place to leave. Um, and, you know, there's uh, not much opportunity uh, in that. That looks to me, I, I can't, let's see if this, is that enlarge it for me? It, uh, did that mess up anything, Andy, for you all? It, it did not. Okay, good. Uh, so that's not Charlotte, you know. Uh, nope. I can't tell you. <laughs> that would be, you know, what you, what teachers always say. That would be a great great subject for a a, a report. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and but you, but you can also see that there are certain parts of the Mississippi Delta that were suddenly depopulated, but they would sometimes people would just move to another part, right? You sure. can see how you know Dallas and Houston can grow even as the rural areas around it are being depopulated. That's what's happening in a lot of this. Is that that Black people and white people are moving to town, but that, that's a good question. It, it really does leap out. You know, in the book about this, I try to explain the big patterns, and I would just sit down and I, I would, if I was presented with a problem, I would say, I have to figure out what's happening in southeastern North Carolina there. Uh, yeah. I guess I didn't do it on that one. <laughs> it, I wonder if it has something to do with tobacco. That looks to be Greensboro, Winston, uh, maybe Durham, uh, the, the, the Triad area. Uh, perhaps it's somehow uh, involved in the tobacco industry. Well, that's a good a good supposition, but the tobacco industry is doing well in the 30s, though, so mm, it's hard right, to know. Right. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for your question, Jan. Ed, let's move to the uh, to the last section. Yeah. So arrival and return. Now, so that maybe seemed like a surprising uh, title for a chapter. It's because for the first time. Well, I'm not going to let you wait and see. Okay, look at this. I, I don't think I actually want to run the video. I don't want to take the time. People can okay. see the pattern here. Look at this during World War II. You all know what you're looking at, right? Look at that. All You, you recognize every single pattern we're talking about. People moving to urban, urban areas in the south. They're moving to the defense industries in the north and in California, right? So it, it's... People need to understand that the, the great migration, it continues, okay? Uh, actually, what, if we let this play, what it would have shown the black population is that that continues all the way through the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s. White population in the South, many people don't know this, more white people left the South during the years of the great migration than black people did. Because where are they going? They're going to California. They're going to Oregon. They're going to the same places that, that people in the North did. But you'll see some parts of the South and of other parts are being depopulated in the 40s and 50s and 60s, especially Appalachia. Um, my own family uh, began migrating to Detroit um, because there's nothing for them in the mountains. So, now we're switching over to uh, Latin American immigration and their descendants. So in 1990s and 2000s, you'll see this is not really surprising in the sense that people from all parts of Latin America are moving to Texas, to Florida, and to the cities of the Golden Triangle there, the Piedmont, Atlanta, but more to California uh, and to the Northeast. But when we switch over to 2000 to 2010, you can see that the South is attracting a lot of people from different parts of Latin America. Texas and Florida continue to boom. But this is when a lot of uh, people uh, are moving to rural areas in the South uh, to work in food processing plants and so forth because it's a place where they can actually get a toehold in the economy. And you can see how the Upper South, where the National Humanities Center is and where we are, uh, is an area attracting enormous numbers of uh, people from Latin America. This is of Asian immigrants. Uh, you see heavily urban, 
uh, early on uh, and remain so 2000 to 2010. Lots of folks moving to Florida and Texas, which are two of the fastest growing states in the United States, but they're also moving uh, to the cities of the north, uh, of the upper south. Important thing to remember, more black people have moved to the suburbs since the 1970s than moved in the Great Migration. 85% of the black people who live in Atlanta live in the suburbs. So it's important to remember that the, uh, for the first time in American history, black people are choosing to move to the South. People reading about uh, Stacey Abrams in Georgia uh, and the sort of resurgence of black political power there, uh, th this is in part a result of migration. Now, we also know, and we'll see here in a moment, the effects of depopulation as well as population movement. One result is rising black political power in the South because black people are moving to the South uh, from, from the North to which they moved before. So let's look at the, the big pattern. So this is domestic migration. So this is everybody. Uh, and what you'll see is that the Upper South is doing quite well in general with population growth, but the Black Belt, exactly what you saw being formed 150 years before, is being devastated by depopulation. And Appalachia is being emptied by depopulation as well. Remember these patterns because we're going to see them again. You see the urban growth in, in Texas. You see the remarkable growth in Florida, but also the growth along the coast. It's sort of the people migrating for retirement or for industry. Uh, the areas you saw before that have been the object of great migration in Louisiana are now being uh, depopulated. So if your students wonder, does this stuff of the pre-Civil War actually matter? Is there a lingering consequence of slavery? All you need to do is look at a map to, of population to see how people's life chances are determined by the county where they're born and the, the kind of migration that's going on. Now, this is a more heartening uh, uh, pattern. I think this is a video worth playing, if you would, Andy, uh, because it, it's surprising. Because I, I mentioned before that I wanted to have uh, projects that had uh, all different kinds of people in it. And we know that Native peoples usually disappear uh, after the Trail of Tears, after the Great Plains, and we know the Indian rights movement, but people don't really have much sense of the enduring presence of Native people. I understand that uh, the, um, you can't hear me talk during the video, so I'm gonna let them play and I'll talk when they come back. Okay, I'm gonna launch this now. It's about 40 seconds long. So that's pretty remarkable. That's something else that I didn't know uh, is that despite the dispossession of all of those people, uh, and you can see they're still anchored in, in uh, Oklahoma, Indian Territory, when Americans were given the first opportunity to self-identify their ethnicity, the American Indian population was one of the fastest growing populations because people were eager to declare that they were in fact part Choctaw or Cherokee or Chickasaw or Lumbee or Seminole. It's interesting that 
the populations of all of those peoples are where they were before forced migration, before dispossession. Um, and so it's interesting to, and I, I, I gave this talk alongside uh, some uh, native historians, um, and it's very important that this be identified as self-identified uh, because uh, the, the people who are actually sustaining these, these populations, it's very important that anybody can't just claim to be have that ancestry. But given the history of native populations of the, of the United States, to see A, how present uh, they still are and how much they have been able to maintain a toehold in the areas that they held ancestrally and how many people want to be considered part of Native American. So you will recognize this pattern and you'll, uh, from the elections, um, which is the election of 2020 looks much like this and you'll recognize the pattern that we've been talking about before. You'll also recognize this pattern of poor health in 2016. We started making these maps uh, before the pandemic, and we had already made this. And here you can see the extent to which uh, where the enslaved population had been dragged and kept that still had poor health in 2016. And you can see the poverty level. The two places, ironically, the places that have the largest percentage of black population and areas that have the largest percentage of white population of Appalachia are places in which you'd have the enduring consequence of health and poverty as a direct result of these patterns of migration. So 200 years after this begins, they are still deeply affecting people. And then, LSU published my book, and uh, the pandemic began just as I was finishing it. Uh, and I asked them if they would be willing to let us uh, to hold hold publication until we could make these slides. Uh, and you can see in the very earliest days of the pandemic, which seemed like 20 years ago, I realized uh, that the patterns that you will recognize in the American South were reasserting themselves one more time. These are the places where uh, the uh, COVID struck first uh, and uh, it's constantly changing pattern, but the South has suffered uh, enormously because of the COVID crisis, because of the uh, pre-existing conditions of health and poverty and lack of investment in, in public health. Um, and so these are different ways that you can see uh, the enduring consequences of the patterns that we're looking at before. So it's a paradox, a place of constant movement, a vast place, a complex place, and yet the patterns established generations ago still have a weight in the America of today. So Andy, I'll come up for air on that before we switch over to showing some of the other things that we have to see if there are questions that people have about the South since World War II up to the present. You know, there are no formal questions at this point. Uh, I'm going to give the audience a chance to sort of think about what you've shared. Again, drop those questions in the Ask the Professor tab. Um, I, I think at this point, what I'd like to do is bring Annie Evans forward and invite her to share a little bit more about new American history. And then we can use the last four or five minutes to take any questions that have, uh, that have remained. Annie, can right. you unmute yourself and join us, please? I have. Can you all hear me okay, Andy? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, I've been dropping a lot of our learning resources and links to other maps and projects that New American History uh, has available. Uh, all of these links are in the slides that I shared with you at the beginning. This is the uh, front page of the learning resources library. You can search by topic, grade level, um, what what type of national standards you're looking for. Um, and we also Lexile our materials because we know that you have a variety of students um, in your classes. And so there may be occasions where you would want to find something on a different reading level um, as opposed to the, the current age level of the students in your class. So we, we try and give you as much flexibility as possible. Um, everything is created for you. There's a teacher version and there's also a student version. On the left, you see the teacher version with the cream colored border. Um, and on the right, 
you see the student version. The only difference is kids really don't want to see the standards and the teaching tips necessarily. So we remove those for you as well as um, a few other teacher resources. Um, and we integrate many of the maps that we've shown you tonight, um, as well as Bunk, which is the site that Ed spoke about earlier, um, The Future of America's Past, which is a PBS series that Ed hosts, Backstory podcast segments that I've been dropping some of those in the chat. All of those are linked into our learning resources on a variety of topics. And so um, tonight we looked at Southern migration over many different uh, eras, but we have things that are on more specific topics. There's a whole separate Trail of Tears learning resource, a whole separate one on Freedom Fortress and Fort Monroe. Um, and the idea is that you can use pieces of these or you can use them in whole. I give all of them to you as a Google Doc. So even though our beautiful container um, is the way that I love to view these learning resources, you may need to make further modifications. And so you also get them on the teacher side as a Google Doc and you can modify them any way that you wish. We hope you'll follow us um, in a variety of ways. I gave you a teaser about subscribing to our newsletter, but we're also very active on all social media platforms. And I'm available to come in and do PD virtually uh, for your school divisions, for your uh, you know organizations that you belong to. So my contact information is here. And I hope that these maps and resources will bring you as much joy as they have brought us. And I'll take Thank questions you, as well as that. Thanks, Annie. And if you'll drop some of those links in the chat box, uh, and I'll bring you back forward. And I think we have a couple of questions that are queued up and about what you've shared tonight. The first question um, uh, I think focuses a little bit on the impact of these maps. You've shared them with us. Uh, you know, we, as you can see in the chat, and as educators have have begun to look at and, and visualize what you're sharing, um, there's they're clearly impressed by them. How are these maps being received by other historians and how are they being received by policymakers, if at all? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, the book's only a year old now, <laughs> and so it's just now time for reviews. Uh, I will be very interested to see what people think. <laughs> uh, it's such an outlier. It's such a strange thing to have done um, that I'm hoping that people will appreciate it, uh, but historians generally have not been eager to take advantage of digital capacities. Now, I've been very clear that I was able to do this because I had allies in the same way I'm able to do New American History because Annie's my ally who knows like 500 times more about teaching history than I ever will. Uh, but I think that, and so I'm able to do this partly because I was the president of the university, and when I went there, they said, we'd like you to keep doing this digital stuff you're doing. And I said, great, uh, I'd like to have a lab. And so uh, if, I, if I were a biologist, you'd give me a lab. Uh, with, I'm a digital humanist, give me a lab, and so they did. So when you see American Panorama at, uh, at, uh, on New American History, uh, they have made maps of redlining that have been among, as far as I can tell, the most widely used uh, digital resource created by historians uh, because they have every uh, city in the United States that had redlining. Now, working with Annie, they're actually adding many small towns. You'd be astonished how many places actually had redlining, but prejudicial lending practices by banks and the United States government. And then those maps, the American Panorama, have been uh, connected to uh, conditions today um, of, um, of health and literacy and environmental health, and you can see the direct consequences of redlining back in the 1930s and 40s. So I would say it's too early to know how the maps that we had in Southern Journey are going to be received and, and used. Uh, in all honesty, they've not really been discovered yet by the world, uh, but the maps of, of my collaborators at the Digital Scholarship Lab are used all the time. They're used by everybody from Zillow to uh, activists uh, to uh, all kinds of classes. So Annie's yeah. made wonderful learning resources for those. So I, I see Southern Journey in many ways as an extension of the techniques that my friends created. 
The difference is I'm looking at things on a continental basis and seeing the big patterns, whereas often the digital techniques are used on a, a, a local basis where we can see the more detailed patterns. You'll see when you go to American Panorama, amazing maps that show the foreign-born population of every county in the United States from 1850 to uh, 2010 um, by ethnicity, by country of origin. And this goes back to the great question about the global south. You'll be able to actually see that. You'll be able to track where your own county, how it's evolved uh, over uh, almost 200 years now. So all that's a way of saying, I, I want you to, if you please would, look at all the amazing maps in American Panorama and the great learning resources that Annie's made to go with them. So I'm confident that when people discover the maps of Southern Journey, when you folks tell your friends about them, uh, that there'll be a consequences. But right now, you, you folks are on the cutting edge. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a few more questions before we conclude tonight. This next question actually comes from two people, uh, Karen and Myla. I'm going to go back to slide 63 to ask this question. Uh, as you may have heard me say in my introduction, uh, both Karen and Myla are in Alaska. They're wondering where Alaska and Hawaii are on your maps. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, since the book's about Southern Journey, they're, they're not on here, but they are on the maps in the American Panorama. Uh, and so a, you'll have to excuse me tonight. But, you know, here uh, you'll, you'll notice all the maps of pre-Civil War were only the South. That's because mm. the, enslaved, the Black population was 98% in the South. And if I'd included all the other areas of the United States, it would have diluted the patterns of, of black history. But since 1900, um, on the continental United States, so I'll just have to ask forgiveness on this front, yeah. but it's mainly because the, the book is really about the South. The, map, the maps are continental, but we basically put them there for other people to use. Uh, but please do look at the maps of Alaska uh, in our other uh, fuller maps. That's a question that has a better answer than that, Andy. <laughs> Look, last question goes to Pamela. Uh, Pamela is joining us from Georgia tonight. She's wondering how much impact it has on the census data when races get reclassified. For example, the percentage of blood that made one black or counting Asians as black in later census data. Yeah. You know, one thing about, about this, so we're looking at billions of data points. Uh, our assumption is that um, the changes such as that in some ways cancel each other out. Uh, we, we cannot know that uh, for sure. I think that the maps I showed of self-identified native populations show that people are choosing multi-ethnic identities ever more. Um, I, so I think that maps going forward uh, are not going to be able to fall into the binaries uh, that the census data put people in for all these uh, generations before. And, and of course, if you go to things like Social Explorer, you can begin to see uh, what some of these gradations mean. But right now, I think it's fair to say that the um, self-identified, I mean, It's a really good question. <laughs> the more I think about it, that I don't believe it would change these big patterns, but it changes the texture and consequence of the lives of our students. We know how many of our students would identify as multi-ethnic, multiracial, right. and that, that's clearly the, the, the way of the future. Uh, I think it's also the case, however, that our patterns of inequality and of politics and so forth have not really begun to uh, reflect those on a continental basis. You certainly see it basically in every community in the South in which there are these different patterns. But I think, if, I'll just end with this observation, Andy, that what this shows is how much we are held hostage to the categories uh, and judgments of prior generations. Um, and that that's the sort of question that when you look at the foreign-born population, you'll be able to see how uh, on, on American Panorama, what a complicated mosaic all of this is. But that's an interesting thing to, for us historians to think about as you're talking to your students, where would you see yourself 
on these maps. And it, it shows, that I, I will end with this warning. You've heard me be kind of an evangelist for the digital. I love it. That map you're showing right now is so beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and so powerful and shows such subtlety. But our students need to understand in the same way that they understand that Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok are not real life. Uh, the data of the past only answer the questions that we ask of them. And so the great questions that you folks have asked tonight are good ways to open these up. So these are beginning points of conversation rather than ways to make something seem certain that in fact was all about movement and change and uncertainty. Professor Ed Ayers, thank you so much for joining us tonight, sharing this just elegant work. And I encourage uh, all of our attendees to continue to explore the New American History resources and the links that Andy and Ed have shared tonight. Ed, thank you so much. Have a great holidays. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our audience for joining us tonight for tonight's webinar. Please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media and uh, feeds, including Twitter, for upcoming programs and opportunities. That includes the last webinar of the fall, uh, the fall season, then we'll have a halftime break. Please join me next week on December 14th. I'll be uh, uh, talking with Mark Chancey from Southern Methodist University on teaching the Bible in public schools, the history, the controversies, and the prospects. I'm gonna drop a link to the community survey in the chat box. We would love your feedback. I don't think you can click it, but you can definitely uh, cut and paste it. Hope to see you next Tuesday. And if not, please have a great break between now and when I see you in early 2022. Thanks everyone. Have a great day at school tomorrow. We'll see you at the next Humanities in Class webinar. Good night, everyone.